do, and it's called God Stories. And I, my small group is basically just God Stories, where we just sit down and go through a Bible story and kind of dig into it. We sit in, our, in the living room, or we've sat around tables here. I kind of like doing it in the house where we're all kind of got a cup of coffee and we're just hanging out. It's my favorite way. <laughs> but um, there's just something about the gift of this. I love this more than I could ever tell you. Um, sometimes my heart races when I'm thinking about the fact that I'm about to go read this in the morning. It's kind of, some would say it's foolish. But there's great joy in the Word of God, and it's a great treasure. And you can have some incredible God encounters, just you and the Holy Spirit, when you take time to sit down and open this up and just read it. Even if you can't always understand parts of it, just getting it into your, into your body, into your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, God can use that to minister to you and to guide you. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do this God story. And how this looks is I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to read this story to you from the Bible. We're going to use seven verses. So it's not a very long story. And I'm going to tell it to you once. I'm going to read it to you. And then I'm going to have somebody else, if someone has their Bible with them, if they have a different version, I'm going to ask them to read it back in a different version. This is like you guys are all in my living room this morning. You're going to have to be loud because the living room is rather large. And we're spread out. And we want to be able to hear each other. Um, we have to be able to hear to know, right? To have understanding, we have to be able to hear. So you're going to have to have big voices today. And then I'm going to have someone else read it in a different version. And then we're going to read it one more time. And then I'm going to ask somebody to tell us the story back, maybe even a couple of you. And we're going to all be like very judgmental and make sure that you catch every detail. And if you don't, we will judge. No, I'm kidding. But we're just going to try, seeing how many details we can catch from the Bible story that we're looking at today. And then we're going to dig in and we're going to do some observations verse by verse of what are some hidden treasures that maybe we've never seen before from these verses that we're reading. And then we're going to go back through one more time and we're going to look at how can we apply it in our lives or what is God saying to me today that is personal for me. So if you want, if you've got your Bibles... You can open them to second. Oh, I got the wrong second Kings. I just have to print the Bible out on paper because I have to do it in size 14 font because I refuse to go to size 2.75 cheaters because I feel older if I have stronger cheaters. Dan's at a 3.0. I'm still hanging at 250 in a blurry kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> no lie, it is kind of blurry. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Second Kings four. Any translation. I'm going to do NLT this morning. So I'm going to do NLT. I'm going to do chapter 4, 1 through 7. If you don't have your Bibles, you just listen along as we go. And if you've got your Bibles, we're going to read together. This is a story about Elisha, who helps a poor widow. Before we read this, I want to just set the scene for you of what's going on. In the Old Testament, they had Bible schools. They call them school of the prophets, or they called them group of prophets. And there would be these young men that would come and they would study the, um, they would study how to be a prophet. They would study the Torah and they would have instruction from um, their elders. Elijah, Elisha, they all were teachers of these school of prophets. Kind of like these Bible schools. They were religious communities and they were there for encouragement and for instruction. And these men were called sons of the prophets or company of prophets. So in this story, there's a widow who is in poverty. Her husband has died, and she has her two sons with her, and she's in quite a place. She's destitute, and she's in despair. So here we go, starting at verse 1. It says this, One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. 
What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons. Shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now sell the olive oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. What a great miracle. What a great miracle. Does someone have it in a different version that they could read? Other than NLT. What do you have? I got NIV. NIV. Read it nice and loud. The wife of the man from the company of the prophets <clears throat> cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditors, or his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elijah replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elijah said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars as each is filled, or uh, put it to one side. She left them and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the olive oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Good. Good. Interesting, different, the different wording. All right, I'm going to tell it again. I'm going to read it one more time, and I'm going to ask you to help me with it. So I'm going to say a sentence and have you finish it for me. One day, the widow of a member of the group of... Came to who? And cried out, my husband who served you is? And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my sons as? What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil. And Elisha said, Borrow as many empty jars as you can from your neighbors and your friends, your friends and your neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and behind you and pour from your into the setting each one aside when it's filled. So she did as she was told, and her sons kept bringing. And she filled one after another. Soon every container was to the... Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. And he said... And then the olive oil, what? Stopped, Stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said, now, two things. He said, now, and pay your debts. And you and your sons can... What's lived on what's left over, right? Look at you guys already kind of memorized seven verses in the Bible. Just like that. Look at that. All right. Who wants to give it a try? Who wants to tell the story? Oh, don't make me call on you guys. <laughs> we won't really judge. I'm just joking. All right, Josh, go for it. Guess really loud. All right. So one day... There is this lady. No, that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. This is a girl. She was in a community of prophets, and she had an issue. She owed someone some debt. So she came to Elisha, the prophet, and asked for help. Um, he said, well, what do you have that you own that you could, you could use to pay your debts? And she said, I only have this small jar of oil. So he said... Go and collect from the, your neighbors and your friends in the community empty jars and bring it to your house. Close the door behind you and you and your sons 
pour the oil into the jars. And so she did that. She went and collected all that she could because he said, don't leave any left. Fill it up as much as you could with all the, all the empty vessels in your house. And, and so they did just that. They kept pouring oil, setting the jars aside as they got full. And as soon as they were out of empty jars, she asked for another one. Her son said, that's all. We don't have any more empty jars. We filled all of them. And so the oil stopped flowing. It was done. So then she went back to Elisha the prophet and said, okay, this is what we've done. He's like, great. Go and sell the oil, pay your debts, and the rest you guys can live off of. Very good. Nice job. Woohoo! All right, we're going to tell it again. Here we go. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to and cried out, My husband who what? Who served you. My husband who what? Is. And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my sons as. Elisha said, what can I do to help you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, accept. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your. Then go into your house with your sons and behind you. And then pour what from your into setting each one aside when it's filled so she did as she was told her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another soon every container was to bring me another jar she said to one of her sons and he said and then the olive oil when she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now what? Sell the olive oil and, and you and your sons can live on what's left over. Right. How about one more person to tell the story? Hmm. Ken, you want to try? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll help you. Okay, you guys, we're going to help Ken. Do we ever know what the lady's name was? Does it say? No. No? <laughs> well, there was this lady that owed money to a debtor. And she came to Elisha and said that my son who served the or my son, my husband who served the Lord um, has died. And I have no way of paying for the debt that I owe. And he said, what do you have in your home? And she says, nothing but a flask of oil, of olive oil. <coughs> and then he instructed her to go have her sons go around the community, friends and neighbors, mm -hmm. gather all of the containers that they could find and bring it to your home, shut the door behind you, and fill all of the containers. And so that's what they did. And the olive oil just kept coming out of that little flask. Which I'd like to know where you get that flask. <laughs> <laughs> but they continued filling all the containers until they were full. And when she said, I need some more, another container, her son says, we have no more left. And at that point, the oil stopped coming out of the flask. She, I'm sure, was overwhelmed. And... She went to Elisha and told him what had happened. And he said, then go take the olive oil and sell it and pay off your debts. And uh, you and your sons live on the rest. Very good. Nice job. Nice job. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go back and we're just going to kind of look at this verse by verse and see what we can find, some observations that we see from the details you know, every single word that's in the Word of God is important, every single one. And so when we break these down, this is how you start to find some hidden treasures, sometimes in stories that you've known your whole life that you grew up with Sunday school. And hi, Headlands. And um, so we're going to look. Here we go. So verse 1, 
One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out. So why is that in the word? Why do we need to know that? One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha. Why would not just one day a, a widow came to Elisha? Why? Any ideas? Someone say it out. Yep. Say it loud. Yep. So they were called um, sons of prophets. These Bible schools, these groups of men were called sons of prophets, groups of prophets. But they were, yeah, they were like the understudies of the men of God, these prophets. So they were called sons of prophets. So it says here, one day the widow of, of a member, one day the widow of a member of the sons of prophets came to Elisha, right? Is that kind of what it says? So why is that? Why do we need to know that? I think it's significant because we're talking about a story about trouble in this family's life. And it's, it's demonstrating that God's people are not exempt from facing trouble. Saying that because um, it's talking about someone who has trouble in their life and showing that people who are men and women of God are not exempt from trouble. That's one reason it could be there. How about another reason? Any, go ahead. Because they, they, you, know, you support your own as far as like Sons of prophets, like they take care of even the widows, obviously, you know, sons of prophets. So, the you know, widow would go to their group of their, what their husband was to ask for support. So, there would be, we would support the group of the people we know. So, the widow goes to this group of people that she has had fellowship with or that her husband has had fellowship with. It's like, it's like here, the leadership, your special privilege, you could say, you put to it because God honors that, the leadership. Okay, God honors the leadership. All right, then, so one day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. How about that line right there, you guys? My husband who served who? You, Elisha. My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. Why is that there? What, what do you think she's saying? Nobody's perfect. How about something else? What else do you think maybe it means here? Danielle. I wonder if she said that to like give herself credits. Like, I, like, it was my husband and he served you and he feared the Lord, so listen to me. You know, like to kind of prove that who she was or prove that she had a, a place there or that you know, her word mattered. Like maybe what she was saying was because I want to have credit, I want you to hear me, this is of value, don't forget, he... You knew him. You knew he was a good guy. Don't forget who he was. I'm, this is of value. You should hear me. My needs are important because he was this, because you knew him. All right. But, but now a creditor has come, threatening to take my sons as slaves. So she's in a threat. And what is Elisha's response? He says, he has two questions for her. The first one is, what can I do to help you? And the second one is, is, what do you have in the house? So how do you think, how, when he's responding to this Elisha, here comes this woman who's like, listen to me, listen to me. I'm in a bad place. I'm about to lose my sons. And Elisha stops and he says, what? What can I do to help you? And what do you think she wants him to do? What's her, what do you think the first reaction of, if you're in this place and this man of God comes up and says, what can I do to help you? What would you ask for first? Money. Save my sons. Help me. I'm getting buried alive financially here. I'm about to lose. I've lost my husband. I'm about to lose my boys. What can I do to help you, he asks. And the second question is that he asks her is what? What do you have in the house? So she, her response could very well have been, what do you need? What do you want me to do? And her response could have possibly been, help me, give me money, help me to keep my boys. And his second question was, what? What do you have in your house? Two questions. Yes, she did. She had to believe. And what was her response, though? She says, he says, what do you need? I need help. 
what do you have? And her response was what? Nothing, Nothing at all. Except what? Do you think at this point she was like, I have this small thing of oil, I think we'll be good. Or do you think it was like nothing at all except, well, this little tiny, what do you think? What was her, how was she thinking there, you guys? What was her mindset? Hopeless? I really wonder if she's keeping in mind, remember Elisha served Elijah, and when Elijah was, there was men that were sent after him by uh, the queen, because she wanted to kill Elijah, he called down fire from heaven on the guys that came to get him. I wonder if she's, she's bringing this problem to Elisha. She doesn't ask for a specific response. She lets him lead what the response is going to be. I wonder if she had that in mind. Maybe. Hey, this predator's coming for my sons. Don't let him take it. Yeah. Did you hear that? So i um, just wondering if maybe because of the story with Elijah and Elisha, that maybe she's hoping that Elisha will call down fire from heaven. <laughs> Is that what you're saying, John? <laughs> and burn the creditors? <laughs> That's not the response that got put on Elisha's heart. Right, know. right. The it's little good. boy in the uh, New Testament that had the bread and the fish, that was the act of faith to respond when they said, does anybody have anything? This little boy. It could be the same kind of thing that she said, this is what I have. It's an act of faith. Yeah, this is what I have. This is all I have is this little bit right here. Yes. Something that we don't necessarily relate to is her culture. Yeah. She's a widow. The only support for a widow was her husband. She now has no support. That's got to be top on her thought process. Right. Okay. We got an idea of what a slave is. But in her culture, your family members can become a slave at an instant because you can't pay your bills. Where we can't pay our bills, we can declare bankruptcy or something. Mm. But she is facing the fact that she has no support and her family is going to go into slavery and there is no solution for her. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yep. Can I put a twist on it? Yep. I mean, we've all been talking about the widow being in a position of desperation, which is probably so. What if the widow knew her rights connected to the family of prophets? She knew that she So Dan's proposal is what if she actually knew her rights and that she, so she's going saying, this is where we're at. I'm in this position and I need help. And so I'm coming because I know my right and I'm blessed because of my life or my husband's life. And so she's saying kind of like not demanding, but saying I'm expecting provision because of this, because I know my rights. I know my position. I think there's a substantial difference in the mindset of going forward with the idea of desperation and I don't know what I have, or going forward in desperation and learn what I do have. Big difference between going forward with in desperation saying I don't know what I have or I don't have anything, or going forward with in desperation saying I know what I have or what is what should come to me. One thing I'd like to just be parallel. Speak loud. One thing I'd like to parallel too is when he asks her what she has, it's almost like when we want to do missionary work. We don't just bring in all these resources and, and just provide them for the people that we're working with. We have to find out like how they're living, what resources they have, and then how they can expand those things. So you know, he wasn't just like, I can give you all this. You know, they find out what, what she had to offer, and then of course you know, the Lord multiplied it. But it's again like when we go into to help people help themselves, we don't just bring in all this Western meditation, we don't bring all this stuff in. We actually live like as the people that we're trying to help or find out what resources they have, live as them, and then we bring ideas to improve that. So it's almost similar kind of you know, missionary. So basically saying that um, maybe he needed to know what she was needing. Like on the mission field, you don't go in with a bunch of resources that are like, well, we know we need a microwave because everybody needs a microwave. You go into the community that you're in, you see what the resources they have and then what they need for their lifestyle and who they are and what their immediate needs are. And then you, after you have assessed that, then you start to minister to their needs. Yep. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I kind of think that her perspective when she came to Elijah was, you know, my husband would 
deal with the church first and put us on the back burner. Mm -hmm. So since he took care of you guys, you have to take care of us. So saying that maybe what her perspective was is my husband put the church first and ministry first and then the Bible school first and put his family on the back burner and now we're in trouble. And now because of that, you need to take care of us because he took care of or he was taking involved in that. Yep, Dan? Well, the other thing though too is... You speak loud? You know, the other thing too is it said in here, and he feared the Lord. So it's possible this guy was a very godly servant of Elijah. And that being, he was also imparting that to his wife. And if his wife knew that, she was saying, well, if God can do, if he's a servant of Elijah, then I live by faith here, mm -hmm. by the Torah and that, then I have the authority and the faith to go to him and ask him for help. Mm -hmm. And I know that if he fears the Lord, he will do this for me. So what Dan is saying a lot, right, a lot like what Pastor Dan was saying, so what he's saying here, what Dan is saying is that um, because this man, we know this man was a man of God, he probably imparted that to his family, including his wife. And so she probably had faith in God. And so because of having that faith in God, she had faith to believe, like go to the right source and ask for what God, was, what God could give her. Yes. I think maybe she said she only had that glass of oil because she had taken stock of her situation before she went to Elijah and she was saying I have nothing except to show what she actually had in her home as a resource to help herself. Yep, so she kind of already knew like she'd taken stock of everything in her life she knew what exactly she had and this was this was it and this is it yep all right, let's move on. So then Elisha gives her a solution, and he says, now go. Borrow as many empty jars as you can from your who? Okay, the NIV version says, I got a kick out of that. Listen to this, you guys. Um, it said, he said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars, and don't ask for just a few. Don't ask for just a few. Like, Ooh, that's exciting. Okay, so borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Tell me about that. What do you observe in that? Yeah, yes. God is big. God is big. She had to humble herself to go to her neighbors and ask for help. She had to humble herself to ask for help. That's true. She gets a direction, but not a reason. She gets a direction, but not a reason. It takes a measure of faith when you only have one jar of oil and you're collecting as many as you can. So take, you need to have to be faithful to make sure that I'm Yep. It takes a measure of faith to know I've only got this much oil, but I'm going to go get all these jars. Anybody else? She didn't ask for the oil in the jars. She didn't ask for oil in the jars. Oh, yeah. This, this is the base. How am I going to fill the jars? She didn't ask how am I going to fill these jars. A lot of this comes from, oh, I'm sorry. A lot of this comes from is faith. A lot yes. of faith here. Krista? I love that the blessings come through her friends and family. Like the blessing that God wants to give her. I feel like every blessing that comes to any of us comes through one another. And so I love that she had to go out. She had to humble herself, yes. But also the faith. And the measure of the blessing was dependent on the measure of her faith. Yeah. So she loved how that she had to go out and how the, the family and the friends were the ones who actually created, helped create the miracle, helped, they were the blessing. And, and according to, the, the miracle was according to the measure of faith. All right, let's, we gotta keep going here, I'm running out of time. Yes, go ahead. I was just gonna say, as well as uh, listening, it had to do with listening. She could've went out and got like one jar from each, or she was kind of in charge of what she was gonna get back. But listening to what, Man, so she was. She had to listen because she could have just gone, taken the direction, said, "I've got to go get some jars." Asked for a jar from each house, or just asked for a few. But she had to really listen to the details. And she didn't know she what the herself. jars were for. Right. And she didn't know what the jars were for. That's true. And her friends and family got to participate in the miracle and be blessed by it. And her friends and family got to participate in the miracle. That's good. Yep. 
So there was two things that happened in this story right there. You guys are talking about faith. But the other thing that happened was obedience. In order for faith to be active, to be fulfilled, a step of faith, there had to be a step of, right? What would happen if she had faith but no obedience? What would happen if she had obedience but no faith? Just food for thought. What happens when they're partnered together? Faith with obedience. Faith with action. Faith with listening. You can't obey what you haven't heard, what you don't listen to. So it didn't matter how she felt. She acted with her will to obey Elisha. Her personal effort combined with her faith created her miracle. Now let's look at this. So now someone kind of touched on this, Krista, you did about how it, um, her family, her friends and family, neighbors and friends were able to participate in it. Can, what was the effect on the community, do you think, because of this? Now this isn't a miracle just for this widow. So, okay, so it affects the, fam it affects the community. Maybe, what if, it, what, if, what if one of the reasons was, because could have Elisha have prayed, like, if he has the, the power, the anointing within God, uh, from God to get those, that oil to flow like that, God's going to bring this provision. Could it have happened um, without the community? I mean, could God have provided for her without the community's help? He could have. But there's a reason why he wants to involve the community. One is to bless the community. Another is, back in the days, now this is a little bit of history here, Chuck, too. Back in those days, it was, if you were a widow, it was your, um, you, you lost your husband, it was your son's responsibility to take care of you. Um, and if not, then it went on to, like, the nephew or whatever. You, like, you had to, you had to take, leave your stuff. Your stuff became the next relative in line, their stuff. It doesn't say that the community had to take ownership of the need or help with the need. But what's happening here? God is all of a sudden opening the door saying to the community, what? Help. Get involved. Be part of a miracle. Care. Interesting, isn't it? I just had one. Jars were quite valuable in those days, too. And jars were valuable in those days. Right, right. It was not like an empty milk jug. Yeah, like, let me go find my ice cream buckets. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a principle here that definitely applies to today, and that is unity. Her friends and neighbors were people of faith like she was, I'm quite sure. And as the, as the church, if we call it that at this point in time, acts in unity, that speaks to the rest of society. Right. And if we move in unity, it speaks to our community that we, we live a life similar and we support one another and we love one another and all those other things. So it's a very important part, of, I think, of the whole thing is the unity of the body. Yep, Daniel. I also think it's interesting that the community gave, that the community gave empty jars. Like in my mind, if there was a widow who was destitute mm -hmm. and I was giving her an empty jar, I don't know how that would benefit her. <laughs> Or why that would be a good thing, like you know, yeah, why not give valuable, a jar of food? But you can't eat this, and you can't, you know, this doesn't meet your need. She's but saying, God why, why, why an empty jar? Why would we give an empty jar, Joan? I think it's interesting that he said your friends and your neighbors, which to me says that all of the neighbors were not friends. Mm, maybe yeah. friends right. your friends and your neighbors. Your friends and your neighbors, Dan. Train up the station. All right, I'll come back around. You remain in Christ by serving one another. You remain in love by serving one another. So this, you know, sometimes it's a challenge to find people to serve. So we open that opportunity for the friends and neighbors to serve, you know, the widow. So they receive, you know, the Lord's blessing and remain in His love by doing it. So it opened it up to the whole community by serving another person. It's That's so a great point. Have a heart to serve and not have. Do you hear that, you guys? Sometimes it's hard to find somebody to serve because we won't be honest with each other. That's me. <laughs> At times, I won't be honest with people and say I need help. But because she was obedient to what Elisha was saying, 
and doing that, she was giving opportunity for someone else to be blessed and to serve. That's a great point. Okay, Dan, the train came back around real quick. I got to get him quick because if he gets. Recognize that God's miracles, and I think the reason he involved the community is all of our miracles are twofold. One is to meet your need, and the second is to bring glory to God. God mm -hmm. never performs a miracle just to perform a miracle. He's glorifying himself yes. and showing his love for his people. Yep, so two things that happens when God's performing a miracle. One is to take care of your needs, and the other part of it is to glorify him, see himself glorified. It's never just for you. It's also to glorify God. Mike. Well, I look at, you know, the empty vessel. It specifically said, ask for empty vessels. It's so easy as us, as Christians, we have the need. We know what the need is. I run out of gas in front of your house. I go up and knock at your door. I don't ask do you have an empty gas can that I can go down and just walk, walk down and get gas? No, I say, would you by chance have a little bit of gas that I can borrow? Yeah. And ask for an empty vessel, you're going to go to the door and say, can I get a vessel full of oil? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, go to your neighbors and ask everybody for one pound of flour. <laughs> and then you'll be good. <laughs> you know, you go, you go and say, can I have an empty flour? Yeah. Flour container, you know. Yeah. What are you asking for an empty flour container for? Yeah, Becky, did you have? Yeah, I, I just thought, but it is a good thing God doesn't show us everything because we do problem solve and, and try to figure out what to do. And this way, he just said, with the empty vessels, she didn't really know what it was right. for. Yeah. Otherwise, we might take it into our own hands right. and solve. Yeah, you hear that, you guys? Sometimes he gives us just a little information at a time so that we're not problem solving and taking it into... If she'd known, well, if I get 10 jars, they're going to be filled with oil miraculously. And if I get 100 jars, they're going to be filled with... It would have changed her whole motive and her whole walk of faith if she'd known all that information. Okay, we got to keep going. Look at how the Word of God comes alive, you guys. Seven little verses. It's so cool. All right. Then it says, then go into your house, this is verse 4, with your sons and shut the door behind you. Why in the world does she need to shut the door behind her? What's the treasures that are hidden in there? What could that mean, do you think? Anybody, anybody? It's to show that you don't know what's going to happen. Your faith that you have in going to your neighbors and friends. When you shut the door, it's like, now I'm going to show you the miracle that I... Shut the door and show you the miracle. Not everybody. Not to everybody know else. that miracle that is to come, or will lose faith as well, yeah. or maybe have too much faith. Um, this thing is really something because it's really like our Christian life resembles a story because we only see pieces. God puts it together, and to shut the door, I do believe there was people like in in uh, the praying for the little boy Jesus did. He had them do it quietly, put it right out. This was for people that didn't have faith. And they shut the door so they could build their faith as they did this. God just put a faith in them that all of a sudden, wow, look what's going on. This could not have happened. Everybody's looking in, I think. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Krista? Well, it reminds me of other times in the Bible when Jesus was teaching the disciples and they didn't shut the door on the unbelief. Put everybody out that may not have had faith, right? So maybe shut the door so that unbelief was kept outside of the door? Jeff. I think to touch on that a little bit is I wonder if the door was closed because the people originally, when they, they went out in faith and collected the vessels, and people gave the vessels. Well, if the door, if all of a sudden, people were seeing the miracle who didn't have any faith to begin with, all of a sudden started seeing it. It'd be, everybody would be fine in everything. Well, the, measure, the blessing was doled out with the measure of the original faith. Not all the people who could see it later on, if they'd have come rushing, hey, you know, I, I had that vessel, yeah. it, it would have watered down. Maybe. So those of you who can't hear that, what Jeff was saying is that um, if the doors had been open and people started to hear this miracle was going on, they probably would have went and grabbed their own buckets or their own vessels and said, hey, let me in on the miracle. But the miracle was given according to the measure of faith before seeing a miracle, before seeing what God was going to do versus, hey, I hear there's a miracle going on. Let's all run to the miracles. Let's go be part of that miracle. So it was according to the measure of faith. That's a really great point. Okay. Okay. 
back where. Oh, Katie. I just I think there's also something about the provision and the miracle happened in private. <coughs> that the Lord offered his provision in mm -hmm. private. And I think that kind of can translate over into like sometimes we look for these big out in the open bang miracles, but sometimes it's about what happens in mm -hmm. private. She's saying that a lot of times it's a maybe what this one is about is that it's a miracle that's happening in the private. It's for a private moment. Instead of sometimes we're looking for the big bang, the big showy miracle, and God's wanting to do a miracle in a quiet place in private. Here was a thought that I had about shutting the door. Um, what if this miracle, kind of what Katie shared on, was just about God revealing himself to these three people? It was a moment for them, the mama and her two sons, without the mob, like God just loving on them. Like it was this precious moment instead of a showy moment. You know, feeding of the 5,000 was a showy God move. But this was a huge God move in a quiet place, kind of same thing, Josiah. Yeah. I think to, to shut the door to remove any doubt at the source. Right, not even Elisha was in there yet. It was just them. Yes, Marilyn? Yep, it has to happen in here, in a private place. Yep. So, what do you think happened with her sons? Can you imagine the impact on her sons? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, they had to be old enough to work to pay off debt. But can you imagine, what if this whole thing, like th those three people, their lives were forever changed. Other people too, but can you imagine that God moment? Can you imagine if it was in your home and you were at your wit's end about something and you had nowhere to turn, you had no answers, and God shows up like this because of your obedience and the measure of your faith. And I can just see them, tears running down their face. Bring me another jar. Look at this, you guys. It keeps coming. It keeps, what a sweet moment for this family. Way more than just the provision, the affirmation that God is for us. God will be with us. God is our source. Something shifted in their lives forever. They would never be the same. Not because they had a hundred buckets of oil, but because they'd had this moment with God. All right, I got to keep moving. So she says, bring me another jar. And the son says, what? There's none left. And then what happens? So if they'd borrowed 10 jars, they would have had how much of a miracle? A 10 jar miracle. If they'd had borrowed... 100 jars, they would have had a 100 jar miracle. What if the question I thought to myself last night as I was rereading, looking through this, what if her neighbors had been even more generous, like she borrowed empty jars? What if they said she needs some empty jars? I think I'll empty out this junk. I have all this junk in my closet. I have all this excess in my life. And I don't need to hold on to all this stuff. And she needs some vessels. I'm going to get rid of the stuff that I've just kept and never even looked at. I'm going to get rid of it because she needs a few extra buckets. What, how much can I give her? She would have maybe had even more. Just a thought that I had about that. Because the miracle went as far as the jars. So then verse 7, when she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil, Pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left over. What do you see in that? What is a truth or a treasure that you can see in that statement? Sell the olive oil, pay your debts, and then you can live on what is left over. Things. She had to take action. It wasn't just like, okay, your debt is paid. She had to go out and sell it and put in that effort. And it was more than she originally went in for. She went in to, just to save her sons from slavery. But God met her need and gave her something to live on. So the two things that Danielle said, for those of you who didn't hear, was, what was the first one again? Uh, she had to make an effort. She had to sell the olive oil. She had to make the effort. She had to sell it. So she had to do a little marketing. So she, again, had another, she had to listen, and she had to, have another, she had to do another step. 
And then the second thing was that God more than met her need. He didn't just keep her sons from slavery. He also gave her something to live on. And, and he more than, God met, more than met her need. Yep. Took care of it. Riley. I think, too, that, like, when you think about it, when I think about it, it's like her provide, she, you look at her losing her husband, I think, oh, she lost the one providing for her. But in all reality, the Lord was providing for the family all along. Yeah. Through the yes. husband. But, yes. And so it was the Lord saying, I'm still providing. I'm still providing for you. I'm not done yet. That's what I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Such a faith builder for her. I yes. mean, it's huge. Think about losing your sons, mm -hmm. you know, and just with all the all oil that was filled up, I mean, and then to have them, for her to be able to provide for them, you know, her faith must have just grew like it. So if any of you are looking, go ahead. Uh, interesting, we don't know the age of the sons. Right. Were they little children, were they teenagers, okay. were they adults? And the Lord says to live on the rest. So was there a timeline there where they lived on the rest until the boys were able to draw an income and take care of their mother? I mean, you just don't know. There's so many variables, but it's the hand of God in the scenario, in the situation. Yeah. It really makes me think about sing along these days. You know, when you're raising yourself on your own, you don't you fully give yourself enough. Yep, so as a single parent, yep, as a single parent trying to be the one who provides and takes care of everything, but if, when you know that God is going to provide for you, you look at things a little bit different. Yeah, good. Here's my thought. It's the best financial plan you guys will ever have in that one sentence. Sell the olive oil and then pay your debts and then live on what's left over. Don't live on the miracle, all of it. Don't consume it all. Pay your debts and live on what's left. I was like, oh, look at that. Financial plan right there. <laughs> it's really good. Okay. Wow. Yes, go ahead. I, I never thought about this before when I read it, but what a security plan for men to know, hey, if I serve you, Lord, if I commit to the house of God, then, you know, we already know that he provides for us, but that whole story, that whole picture, what an awesome picture of security for men, you know, to know that their families will be taken care of. You lead your family to commit to the house of God and set that as a standard, mm -hmm. and God will continue to bless your family even when you can't, even when you're not there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I want, I'm going to change things around a little bit. I'm going to ask up for some applications real quick here before we wrap up. I want to ask you, some of you would be honest with us today. This is us all sitting in the living room as a church family and just talking about Jesus and talking about the word. We have meditated and kind of chewed a little bit on some different thoughts here. And it's been really simple. You didn't have to have a lot of theological understanding to be able to start getting some truths that maybe the Holy Spirit started to whisper in your heart because today the Holy Spirit started to whisper some things in each of your hearts. The word never returns void. And so my question is, is what is the thing that the Holy Spirit kind of whispered in your heart or brought to mind for you? Not maybe even for your life personally, but like this is a revelation that I start to see that I maybe haven't seen before. The Holy Spirit gave you a revelation that you maybe I did not see in this story or in your life before until we sat together and talked about this story. Can someone give me an example of that that's happened this morning? Joan. Um, I'm going back to the friend and neighbor thing. All of her friends were probably believers like she was, but her neighbors may not have been, but they saw what happened. They saw how she was provided for. Everything we do in life, sometimes we think it's just for us. People are watching. They see what we do. They see how God provides. Yeah, so there's the truth that God gave you today. Janine. Helena Mortimer. Helena Mortimer, yeah, the little widow, yeah. who has a yeah, husband. Whose husband has served faithfully. Yeah. 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 So, 
I'm struck that all the questions, the variables, how old were the sons, and all the questions we had don't affect the, what God was going to do. So it could be any of us. And it's all of us. And that just blows my mind, really. I don't think I've ever read a story and I think of how, how I fit into that story, how my life fits into that story. But that doesn't affect the story. Right. Did that make sense? Yes, it absolutely made sense. sense. So what she's saying is that the different questions, the things, that, the holes in the story, the details that we don't know, don't affect the story. And so the questions in our life don't necessarily, they don't affect the miracle that God's going to do. And it's not, it's for every one of us. So go ahead. Who did I see? Go ahead, Donna. I was going to say, um, and it depends on the person, but uh, if you've been around the block, <laughs> so to speak, I've learned to trust in Jesus and in his name and in the word, of course, um, because people will fail you. Yeah. Yeah, people let people down, and life lets people down, but God never lets us down. Never, ever. Ken? Um, something that just um, kind of came to my mind uh, listening to everyone and, and, the, and the scripture that was read is that the prophet asked her, what do you want me to do? And Jesus in the New Testament said the very same thing when people came to him, what is it that you want me to do? And I have to believe in today as we serve the Lord, when we have needs, I think he wants us to be specific. You know, what do you need from me? Mm -hmm. You know, and God will and I have that proof in my own life. God will more than supply the need. Yes. You know, it may not be the way that we think it's going to happen, but He does. When we look back, we say, "Wow, what an awesome God we serve." Right. Pastor Ray, why don't you share your comment that you had about the empty vessel? Um, yeah, it speaks of the empty vessel there in verse three, and then it goes on and it talks about more in detail there, but. Um, stood out to me a little a little uh, clear this morning as I read through here and we and I look in uh, verse I know as we went verse by verse we didn't quite get to this because I know we're switching modes yeah. but in verse 6 it said there is not a vessel more and then in the King James it says and the oil stayed <clears throat> and the meaning of the oil staying is that um, there are um, inexhaustible resources available to us to those that serve him faithfully. And uh, it just really hit me to a greater degree today, today that, that, that that is so a reality for those of us that believe and walk faithfully to him. And that uh, inexhaustible supply of resources that are available to us. But then the empty vessel aspect of it is, is when we are weak, then we are strong. Yeah, when we're weak, when we empty are vessel. empty, then we're God empty. is able to fill us up. And then this we're guy is strong. limited. And that's yeah. in of ourselves. You know, we're trying to do things in our own yeah. in our own wisdom and, and whatever and whatever. But when we realize that, hey, when we're and living in an aspect of my of my daily awareness of my very need of Him in every area of my life, yeah. He will supply more than anything that I could even imagine. Amen. Yeah. So I, I've got to wrap it up, you guys. Sorry, but we could go on forever. There's no. I'm sorry. To, hold on, no, Mark. Just let me go on. I got. I got other stuff. I got to share. I know there's so much good stuff. There's so much good stuff. There's so much good stuff. But listen, this is what I wanted to get across today. You can take just about any part of the Bible, and you can do this. We're on a series right now called the Bible, and it's because we believe that the Bible is the beginning and the end of truth, and it's so important for all of us. And in the Bible, you're going to be led to salvation. You're going to be given wisdom. You're going to have your steps in your life are going to be guided by God in the correct path. The Word of God is going to bring you joy. It's going to bring you healing. It's going to bring you hope. The Scriptures will bring you peace. 
And those things come if you get in the word. You got to get in the word. You got to get in the word. The word of God is so important. And the word of God from somebody else, secondhand word of God, is not, does not have the power of personal time in the word of God. It is not the same. If all you do is listen to preachers, if all you do is read someone's book, there's great truth and they are a great gift to all of us. But it does not compare to you spending time in the word where the Lord whispers to your heart a truth that's straight from the throne of God. So I implore you, I encourage you guys to get in the word. I want to read this scripture to you. Deuteronomy eleven eighteen. 18. So commit yourselves wholehearted to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road. When you're going to bed and when you're getting up, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. It's so important, no different than the importance of what happened in the community because of the obedience with this widow. It's so important the time that you spend in the word and when you talk about it when you wake in the morning, when you talk about it at night, when you talk with your children about it, when you talk with your loved ones, when you talk with your coworkers, when you talk with your friends, the impact that it will have. And it's, it's, it's like a mandate. And so you choose. I'm not going to get in the word because, you know, it's just not that interesting to me. So you're not going to get the joy. You're not going to get the guidance from God. You're not going to. That's your choice. You have that right. But can I just tell you this? If that widow had said, no, I want, I just want something here. I'm not going to go and involve my neighbors. The impact of her obedience, the impact of her faith did something in the community. Correct? It did something in her boys because of her, her faith and her obedience. When you get in the word of God and you teach your children what you are discovering in the word of God, when you teach those under you, those around you, those you love the word of God because of what the word of God is doing in you and through you, it's not just about you anymore. It's about the people around you the people's lives that you touch. So now what I'm saying is, Lord, when I get into your word, you're going to lead me to salvation, but you're going to lead my kids to salvation. You're going to lead my family to salvation. You're going to lead my coworkers to salvation because I'm going to have the word of God in me and I'm going to have some answers. You're going to guide not only my steps, Lord, when I get in the word, but because I'm going to teach my children, they're going to know how to, to take their steps. They're going to be guided by the word of God. So my decisions don't just impact me. My decisions and my daily actions impact everyone around me. Her decisions that day impacted mostly her boys. It impacted her community. I want my children to come to salvation. I want my children to know how to go and make decisions in life. I want their steps to be guided by God, by the word of God, versus man's opinion and man's wisdom. I want my children to get wisdom, supernatural wisdom for their life that only comes from the word of God and not from man's opinion. I want my children's burdens to be lifted, just no different than I want my burdens to be lifted, because they've been in the word of God and they have a love for the word of God. I want them to have joy because they have found it in the word of God, because I've taught them how I have found joy in the word of God. I want my children to experience the peace that passes all understanding that's found right here. Because I can show them and I can talk to them daily about how I have found peace right here. The word of God is so, so important. It is the cornerstone of our faith. This book is the cornerstone of our faith. This is what we need. The word of God, is, it, it's going to be, it shores you up, and it, it, it's your true north. This is a great value. I've had seasons where it's been very dry in my life, where I've not been very excited about the word of God. There's been times when my Bible has sat on the shelf, 
I'll be honest with you, like long times, long times, long periods of time, not been interested. Then there's been times when I've had myself in the word out of discipline. I'm going to read my devotional. I'm going to read my chapter. And then there's been times when I have cultivated it to the point of where I'm, I'm not just going to do it to do it. It's not part of my checklist, like take my vitamins and read my chapter. It might be just a verse, Lord, will you just give me something today that you want me to hear from your word? This is such a beautiful treasure, you guys. Now today, you guys have had a revelation that you haven't had before about the story. My question is, is do you think maybe you'd go and eat at lunch? When, would you talk about it? Would you do as Deuteronomy says, talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road? Would you talk about the word of God instead of what's going on politically today? Would you talk about the word of God instead of about our next step in retirement? Would you talk about the word of God today instead of about what aches and pains you have? <laughs> Would you do it when you're going down the road with your spouse, with your friend, with your coworker? Would you write the word of God on your doorpost so that when people walk through the door of your house, they're being covered by the word of God at your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth and you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. The Lord wants you to flourish and he's given you everything you need. He's a God who cares about every single detail. There's miracles for your life in the hidden place. There's miracles for your life that are in a big showy thing that's going to go on. God wants to direct your steps and he wants to impact you. And then he says, and I want to impact you for one reason, to bring me glory so that I can be glorified. That's the gift of the word. Let's close our eyes. Jesus, we thank you for the gift. Josiah, you want to just, oh, Josiah left. Oh, you want to just lead us in a closing song? Lord, we just thank you for the gift of the word. We thank you, God, that you are such a loving God who you didn't just do your thing and send your son and then leave us hanging, but you gave us stuff for every day of our life. You gave us everything we need for our daily walk. I ask God that you impart a fresh passion in us for these truths, and we thank you for it. In your name we pray, amen. We're going to close with a song, so let's just all worship together.